you're watching this video, then you're considering doing the Great Loop. And let me tell you, you should. The Great Loop, what is it? Well, it's an interconnected series of waterways. It's about 6,000 miles in length, and it goes from, well, and you can start anywhere on it, but we started on the shores of Florida, up through the Intracoastal Waterway, uh, along the Atlantic Shoreway, uh, through the Dismal Swamp, into the Atlantic for a bit, up through the Hudson River, past New York City, uh, around, we went through the Erie Canal, although there is another route through Canada. You can go through the, uh, the Rideau Canal. You can go through the Trans-Severan Lock System uh, into the Great Lakes. You can take a route that takes you through Lake Ontario or not. Uh, you'll go through Lake Erie, up through Lake Huron, past Mackinac, down through Lake Michigan, uh, into the river system where you'll start out in the Illinois You'll end up in the Mississippi. Uh, you'll end up in the Ohio for a little bit, unless you decide to just want to stay in the Mississippi. Um, then you'll end up in the Tom Bigby Waterway, down into the Gulf of Mexico, through the Gulf of Mexico, around Florida. Either you'll go through Lake Okeechobee and cut through Florida, or you'll go down around the Florida Keys, and then you're back in Florida again. So you might wonder, if you're thinking about the Great Loop, uh, how much boating experience do I need to have before doing this? And the, the truth is, is that this might be the best epic boat journey that you can do with the smallest amount of experience. Because the truth is, you to get experience along the way. Of course, the more familiar you are with the, the rules of how boats navigate, of uh, you know maintenance procedures on your own boat the more comfortable and the more joy you might experience out there but it's not absolutely required to be out there you're not going to be in 12 foot seas um, and the things you're going to deal with you'll be getting them generally enough uh, at the time and enough people there to help you that, it, that it's not uh, really a life endangering journey my wife and i began this journey in March of 2021 and we started out from Eastern Florida started working our way up along the Intracoastal Waterway and through this you're coming through some amazing bird watching country you're coming through some very narrow channels um, but you're coming through some absolutely gorgeous waterways not a lot of tidal shift there in Central Florida as you come up into uh, the top of Florida and into Georgia, that's going to change drastically. You're going to go to where you have sometimes nine foot tides. You're also going to be getting more effects from the Atlantic Ocean because, as you can see, Georgia is actually really a series of islands outside there that form that barrier wall between you and the Atlantic. So you're going to want to take some of those uh, into consideration. Some fantastic stops here and some of our favorite stops along the whole way. Cumberland Island and the wild horses that are there, along with the ruins of families' fortunes that really it's difficult for us to even imagine. So when you see these ruins, this is the Carnegie family. So this is U.S. steel money that built these. Then they burnt down, uh, especially Dungeness burnt down in the 60s. Uh, and so that's what created the ruin that is there today but the wild horses that they just left on the island have continued to breed and thrive uh, and enjoy contemplative moments staring out at the ocean and wondering why why everything as you come along through this area there's going to be some beautiful historic towns so from Beaufort to Beaufort Savannah uh, Charleston Make sure that you spend the time in these little cities. They are, and they're not little cities, they're big cities. They're gorgeous, and they're so southern hospitality at its absolute best. Some of them have docks that you can stay at for a certain amount of time, sometimes overnight, sometimes not. Regardless of how you get to them, all these cities are worth seeing. You're going to boat through some cypress swamps here that are just absolutely incredible. And you're not going to see this along the rest of the journey, so make sure to take your time through this section and enjoy this. These cypress trees create an absolute envelope of green, forested area that is just absolutely a marvel to behold. 
the Great Dismal Swamp, really anything but dismal. This is an absolutely beautiful natural area, and I, I can't say what it was like to create it when it got the name, but now this is a natural splendor, and boating through it is such a privilege and a pleasure. If your draft allows, make sure you consider going through the Dismal Swamp. When you come out of the Dismal Swamp, you'll be in Norfolk, and you'll have a chance to see the absolute naval might of the United States on display in front of you, and if you're not careful, running your little boat right over. Coming out into the Chesapeake, you'll have a chance to sail some of the most beloved sailing waters in the entire United States, and the Chesapeake Bay sailing, it, it is just absolutely beautiful. It gets fantastic wind, and there are bays and coves more than you could explore in a lifetime. Coming through what's called the C&D Canal, this connects the Chesapeake to Delaware Bay. And as you come out into Delaware Bay, now you're going to be out in the Atlantic, especially if your draft won't allow you to go on the inside course of uh, New Jersey. But it's a great chance to get your feet wet in the real ocean. And for us, it was kind of our first experience with, with true ocean sailing. And it's great because it's in sort of single day chunks as there are a couple of stops. You can stop in Atlantic City, uh, and making your way up to Massaquan before you finally come into one of the crown jewels of it and come into the Hudson and where you'll be right behind the Statue of Liberty. Make sure that you spend at least a day hung out behind the Statue of Liberty. You want to see it through every phases of the sun. If you've got paddle boards, this is a fantastic opportunity in the morning to paddleboard around the Statue of Liberty and see this in a way that most people can only ever dream of. You're also going to get a chance to see New York City from an angle that people really can only dream of. And there's really no prettier way to see a city than sailing by it. The water side is always the most presentable side of a city and seeing New York from there, it really is magical. Uh, there's multiple places to stay here. A lot of people stay out on the New Jersey side, but know that there are some marinas depending on your draft and what type of boat you have on the New York side, which allows you without taking a train across uh, to get direct access into the city. We stayed on Dykeman on 200. There's a marina up there that just got taken over by the city and uh, we had a fantastic experience. Once you're done seeing the sights at New York City, you're ready to start heading up the Hudson. And now you're gonna be heading up into larger upstate New York and things are gonna get quiet real fast. But you're gonna to get to go past some really neat things. Uh, you're gonna to get to see the Military Academy. Uh, you'll be going past universities and you're getting into small towns. And not too far up here, if you've got a sailboat, it's going to be time to get your mast down. And uh, our suggestion would be, because it's the cheapest way to do it and learn something about your boat, Castleton on the Hudson. Not only is it a fantastic sailing community and boating community there, just some amazing people. Stop in, have a drink, tell them Uncle Roan sent you. When you hit Waterford, you're going to need to have made a decision about which way to go. And I can't tell you about going through Canada because when we did, the Canadian borders were closed to private boaters, so we didn't go that way. I, I don't have anything bad to say about that way. I'm sure it's magical, but I can tell you that if you decide to continue along the Erie Canal, I can personally guarantee you're going to have a fantastic time. By this point, you will have been through several locks, but the Erie Canal, you're going to get a chance to go through a whole bunch of locks, like enough locks until you are a lock expert. Uh, all the lock people that we found working there were all very pleasant. We tried to give them as much radio notice as we could, but they did nothing but smile. Along the way, you're going to visit little towns along the way. And if you get really lucky, when you hit Lyons, New York, you'll run into this guy, Bob Stopper. Bob was an English teacher. He retired, and he is an absolute authority on the historic Erie Canal, and he loves sharing that information. And in fact, it can be hard to not have him share that information. We missed Bob and Lyons when we stopped in for the Peppermint Festival, but we caught up with him in Newark when we got stopped for a couple weeks due to some maintenance issues on one of the locks ahead of us. And Bob came up one evening and gave us all a, a full tour complete with slide deck and Q&A session and was just an absolutely invaluable 
and highly enjoyable resource. If you get a chance to meet Bob, take it. He is a fantastic guy. If you've gone all the way through the Erie Canal, you're going to come out in Buffalo. And this is where you're going to need to put your mast back up. You're going to want to call ahead. Um, there are a couple different places to do it. Um, the cheapest place has a guy that's maybe a little bit temperamental, but uh, we found him to be very nice. And he happened to be on vacation when we were there. But uh, so we, we used a marina a little bit further up. Uh, and remember not to go too far or you'll fall over the Niagara Falls. Once you're out on Lake Erie, uh, you're gonna want to make sure that you really are taking the weather into consideration, which can be a little bit of a shift because if you've been in the canal for, we were there for almost a month, you, you kind of forget that weather becomes that big a concern. It's a big concern. The westerly winds that can come across Lake Erie can whip up a really, really nasty lake. Now, we happen to have a very good weather window and we did uh, an overnight crossing and it was just absolutely lovely. You could have water skied behind it. You could see the stars, the lake was so still, but I assure you that is not always the way that it is. At the end of Lake Erie, you're gonna be coming up upon Detroit. And I know a lot of people are gonna say, don't visit Detroit. And I, I just, I really can't say, I don't know what those people are thinking. There's a city marina there and it can be a little bit hard to get in. You wanna call, you wanna sweet talk them a little bit. You wanna definitely use your most charming. Um, they kept telling us there wasn't a slip, but when we got there, one magically you know, found itself and, uh, and there were a lot of open slips the whole time we were there. The area around that has been made a really pedestrian friendly area. There are walkways, you can get right into the city. You can go over to where the Detroit Lions and the Detroit Tigers play. It really was a beautiful city and, and we just really enjoyed the day that we spent there. Once you've decided to leave Detroit, you're gonna be coming up through the St. Clair area. Uh, there's a big lake in the middle here and then you're gonna be battling some uh, water flowing directly against you as Lake Huron comes down to dump into Lake Erie. Once you get on Lake Huron, if you're sailing, this might be some of the best sailing you do the whole time. The winds are, are very favorable here for sailboats. They're come out directly on the beam. We did some very fast and very beautiful sailing. It's important to remember that Michigan has what they call safe harbors. So about every 20 miles on the coast of Michigan, there will be harbors that you can go into. And they do have an area that you can anchor or you can go in and you can get a slip. We found the slips to be very affordable. So most of the time we just slipped in for one of those. Did you catch that right there, slipped in? Oh, that's pretty good, right? Oh, that's quality. Look at those puns. Once you come out of the top of Lake Huron, you're gonna come out into the Mackinac area. So, and it, just so you don't look stupid like I look stupid, it doesn't matter how you spell it, it's always pronounced Mackinac. So it's not Mackinac, it's Mackinac. I said it wrong all the time. Anyway, if you get a chance to stop at the island, this is really cool. It's kind of a historic place. There are no automobiles allowed there, so it's all horses and fudge shops. Uh, it's basically horse-drawn everything and fudge shops, and, th and that's, that's about it. But it's a great place to explore on foot or by bicycle if you brought folding bicycles, which we, again, highly recommend. It's a great place to explore. Now you're going to be coming down Lake Michigan, and this is a good place to start paying attention. Um, not that it's not important to pay attention everywhere, but Lake Michigan can have some really nasty winds that come up from the Wisconsin side over to Lake Michigan. So if you're taking the Michigan way down, you want to keep in mind they have those safe harbors every 20 miles and how far you are out. You want to be checking the wind forecasts and realize that it can be nasty, not just when the wind is blowing, but for the day following when the wind has blown really hard. Keep an eye on it. Um, we had some real issues here and, and I did not pay attention or I did not give it enough of a berth. And uh, we had a very bad day when we pulled into New Buffalo at 11 p.m. We damn near just sold the boat right there. So bear it in mind that uh, anywhere along these lakes can get nasty in the right conditions or the wrong conditions. And uh, just take it into account, safe harbors, often enough that it shouldn't be an issue unless you make it an issue and you start thinking that you've got a schedule that's more important than the weather. Once you've reached the bottom of Lake Michigan, 
you're going to be into the Chicago area. So if you are masting, then you got to get that mast down because there's a fixed bridge in Chicago that is just over 14 feet. And so your air draft cannot be more than that. Once you get it down, you are going to get the chance to see Chicago in a way that only people who pay for tours get to as you take your boat right through downtown Chicago. Look up at the skyscrapers, see the people having lunch, wave at the Chicago Stock Exchange. This is, what a fantastic trip this is down there. Um, it only probably takes a half hour, but it really can be one of the most memorable bits of your entire trip. And just like that, you're into the river system. So you're gonna start out in the Illinois River. What you're gonna find is that depending on which river you're in, and you're gonna be in a number of rivers here most likely, Sometimes the rivers are with you, and sometimes the rivers are against you. Sometimes they are flooding, and sometimes they are very low. So bear this in mind. Make sure that you're looking ahead and behind for what's happening, what's coming up in front of you, what's happening behind you, and make sure that your fuel stops um, have been timed correctly so you don't get into a place where somewhere has such a low uh, water level that you can't get in for fuel. Um, we had a place where luckily we were able to get in, but most people were not uh, outside of Peoria. But you're going to be coming through a great place, and you're going to hear some horror stories. Uh, Joliet is kind of famous. Make sure that if you see locals there and they're fishing or something else, make sure you say hi. Make sure you are polite. Um, this is a place where it, it doesn't take much of a uh, scoff at people and uh, they seem to like to do kind of nasty things to people's boats. We, we were nothing but friendly and we tried very, very hard to be friendly knowing that that could be an issue. And it worked for us and that's about all I can tell you on that. As you come past the St. Louis Arch, don't forget to give it a wave and check out their cam later as they take a photo of you. If you know the exact time that you went by there, um, then you can see your boat from a distance, which can actually be a more difficult thing than you think. We, we finished this whole thing. We were out 18 months, and I probably had two or three shots of our boat in total, so it's kind of a neat opportunity to, to wave at your family because there's no way for you to get off the boat in St. Louis. Um, you have to be quite a ways up or downstream to find where there's a marina where you can get off, and it's just not an area that's particularly conducive to that. The waters on the Mississippi can be a little bit treacherous. Um, you want to look out. They've got these large embankments that come out from the side, and they can create some whirlpool action. So at least for us in the catamaran, we, we could find that we're basically pointed down the river, just doing perfect, making great time because the river is with you and suddenly we would be 90 degrees off of where we were before. And I mean, it spun the boat in a second or two. So just be aware that it's happening. Uh, keep an eye out for that. Keep an eye out for big logs. Um, but really the Mississippi was great. We didn't have any complaints of that. It can be a little bit difficult to find anchorages, but, but they are out there. Uh, it can be quite a distance between fuel, but on the Mississippi, you do have the river going with you. So it's less of an issue than you think because you're not fighting anything. Make your way down through the rivers here on the Ten Tom waterway. Uh, you're going to find very small communities. Um, not all of them are particularly pedestrian friendly or bicycle friendly, but talk to the people at the marinas that you stay at. Oftentimes they have someone who's willing to, say, run propane for you or run you around to get groceries. Sometimes they have uh, cars that they're willing to let. Sometimes it's for free. We, we encountered a lot of hospitality, a lot of really nice people. It's a good place to stay in marinas, though, if you're gonna, if you need something like groceries, supplies, propane, fuel, any of those things. Um, they're kind of centered around those. And uh, ask the people there, smile, say please and thank you a lot, and see if you don't get treated with some real nice hospitality. Just like that, all the barges will be behind you, and you'll be getting spit out into the Mobile Bay. So, Mobile, Alabama's right here at the end. And if you're on a sailboat, it's time to put that mast back up. Um, there are a few places around that area. Um, you can go as far as you need to. Look for the right spot. Uh, it's going to run you, ran us about $500. Once you're in the Gulf, you're going to have to decide which way you're going to cross it. There's kind of two routes here. And one is to put one foot on the land. And that means you're taking the big bend of Florida and you're staying very close to it. The other one is you can cross from kind of like Apalachicola area 
and cross directly down to like the Clearwater Tarpon Springs area, which is what we chose to do. That is a long crossing. You want to be very careful about your weather window. You want to look and see what the winds are going to do. You want to look and see what the waves are going to be. Um, we broke a rudder at about three o'clock in the morning and uh, it was a little frightening as Carrie's holding my legs trying to have me bungee the, uh, the rudder as the rudder cage broke around it back onto the boat. But regardless, we arrived in Clearwater alive and uh, found a welder there to fix our boat and everything was happy and good. You're now into the pretty parts of Florida, sort of clear water, St. Petersburg, Sarasota. As you come down this area, take your time, go everywhere. Um, plenty of places to see restaurants and get supplies and everything else. As you come down to about Fort Myers, this is going to be the end of that sort of pretty side of Western Florida. And you'll be into the Everglades Park, which is great, but it is completely unpopulated. So you want to start now thinking about what your course is going to be. Now, you could cross, go into Fort Myers and go up across the Okeechobee Waterway. If you're a sailboat, depends on what your mast height is. Um, there is a railroad bridge at the eastern edge of the Okeechobee River that can limit you to, I think, about 49 feet. Um, so if it's that, then you need to go down to the Keys. And if that's your excuse for going down to the Keys, take it, because you should go down to the Keys. You do want to watch out for fish traps in this area getting down to the Keys as there are entire areas that are absolutely littered with them. It's going to make your day bad. It's going to make their day bad. So look on your charts and see if you can't just avoid these areas altogether. If you just arrived into Key West, good times are abounding. Key West is one of those places. It is an absolute Velcro harbor and it can be hard to escape, not because it's difficult to sail out of there, but why would you want to? Good times are had everywhere. Uh, if you find a spot in one of the city marinas, it's actually not that expensive. Um, they can be difficult and hard to come by depending on the time of year. But Key West, man, what a great time. I almost just ditched the rest of my plans and just stayed there forever. It's a great time and uh, if you can make it down there, I highly suggest it. As you come out of Key West, uh, you're gonna start coming around the, the crest of Florida there into sort of the Miami area. This is where you should consider going to the Bahamas and where I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you go to the Bahamas. Now, should you start with the Bahamas? No, and let me tell you why. Because the Bahamas will ruin you for everywhere else. The water is so beautiful, the sailing is so magical, um, the spear fishing is so fantastic, the fishing is so fantastic. Um, the other boaters that are there, the beaches are so beautiful that it, it, it'll kind of ruin you for everywhere else. So you should save this for the end. This is the, you know, this is the cherry on top. The Bahamas are just absolutely magical. So if you're interested in doing the Bahamas, we are looking at setting up a Facebook group to figure out what is the ideal loop to see the Bahamas in one big loop. I'll put a link below. And that's it. That's the great loop. At least if you start in Florida, remember, you don't have to start where I started. Start wherever you want, but start somewhere and start today. Get whatever boat you can afford to get today and go. It is wonderful. It is fun. It's not the most expensive thing in the world. And in fact, my wife and I, we set out to do it as cheaply as we could to kind of encourage people to do it. And also because we needed to do it as cheaply as we could. We spent eight months working on a boat, rehabbing it. And when we finished, we sold it for enough that we actually made 16,000. That's after paying for marinas and fuel through the entire loop. So it can be done without a million dollars in the bank. You can do it because I did it and I'm a half brain jackass. I knew very little about sailing. I'm from Utah. I learned as I went, it's all out there. There's lots of helpful people. Go out, do the great loop today. Through this area, you're going to come through some. It doesn't re doesn't really matter how you spell Mackinac, M A C M A W. It still produced. 
still. 